Where the Flame Trees Bloom by Alma Flor Ada, with illustrations by Antonio Martora, Martora, read by Vianna Vance. Introduction. I was born in Cuba. The largest of the islands in the Caribbean, Cuba is long and narrow. If one looks at a map of Cuba with a little bit of imagination, the island resembles a giant alligator resting on the water. The western part of Cuba is very close to Florida, while the eastern part is very close to the, to the Dominican Republic and Haiti. In climate and natural beauty, Cuba is very similar to Puerto Rico. In fact, Cubans and Puerto Ricans have a shared history, which is why a Puerto Rican poet once said that Cuba and Puerto Rico are two wings of the same bird. <coughs> On both ends and in the center, Cuba has high mountain ranges covered with dense tropical forests. In between these three mountainous regions there are flat, fertile lands. I grew up in the Eastern Plains, the cattle region on the outskirts of Kemawe, a town of brick houses with tile roofs and strong old churches built of stone, which in the past had served as both houses of worship and refugees from pirate, refuges from pirates. The church's high towers once allowed lookouts to keep watch for cattle thieving and buccaneers. The house I was born in was very large and very old. My great-grandfather on my mother's side had given it to my grandmother, his daughter. My youngest aunt, Lolita, had been born in the house. A generation later, two of my cousins, my younger sister, Flor, and myself were also born in the same house. Although the house was large, we were not wealthy. However, I did grow up surrounded by a wealth of family. At one time or another, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins all lived together under that roof. Yet for the first seven years of my childhood, I was the only child living in the house. Two older cousins came occasionally for visits. The house we lived in held a lot of history, too. It had been built as a colonial hacienda for an Italian family, the Simoni. In the hacienda, they planted crops, raised cattle, tinned hides, and made bricks, tiles, and household vessels from the red clay found by the river. In those days, all the work was done by the people the Simoni kept as slaves. Much later, by the time I was a child, the house had grown old and weathered. The gardens were overgrown, and the fountain, dry and filled with earth, served as a planter for ferns. Behind the house still stood the slave quarters, and the remains of a dungeon, the calaboso, were proof of the horrible things human beings can do to each other. Once upon a time, slaves had been chained to the iron rings on its walls. During the colonial times, one of the two daughters of the Simoni family, Amelia, married Ignacio Agramonte, one of the Cuban patriots who fought to gain independence and freedom for all who lived in Cuba. One of the first acts of the Cuban Revolution in 1868 was to free all slaves. It was this connection with the Cuban struggle for freedom, not its earlier history, that made my family proud of our home. For me, the past was still filled with unexplainable questions. How could anyone dare to think that he could own or control anyone else? And why were we so proud of freedom and independence while some children walked the countryside barefoot and hungry? Despite these questions, big ones for the child I was, the old house was for me a magic world all the same. My grandmother kept large flocks of chickens, ducks, and geese, and as a reflection of her love of beauty, peacocks as well. The peacocks would often perch in the dining room windows, which opened out into a garden. Sometimes they would nest atop a large white masonry arch, which had been built long before as a small-scale replica of the French Arc de Triomphe in the now abandoned garden by the river. Bats lived in the eaves under the porch, and doves lived on the terrace. My mother took in every lost cat that crossed her path, and the garden was busy with lizards, snails, frogs and toads, and crickets and grasshoppers. Hidden in the branches of a nearby tree lived a family of hawks, but among all these living things, my best friends were the trees. Big, firm, and strong, they offered me their friendship in many ways. Their green canopies created a treasured shade during the heat of the day, allowing me to stay outdoors, protected from the tropical sun. Whether I was lonely or joyful, they always welcomed me. Flame trees, more than a hundred years old, formed an avenue along one side of the house, leading to the white arch and the river. They were gnarled with age. Their large roots protruded from the earth, offering me a nest where I could crawl in and feel protected and secure. The roots, worn smooth by the weather, were soft to the touch, and I would caress them as one would hold a friend's hand. The old river, winding its way through the land, had formed a rather large island behind the house. Long ago, the island had been planted with fruit trees. Now the mature trees were generous with their fruit, offering throughout the year different surprises far better than any dessert coming from our kitchen or any candy that could be bought at the store. Bittersweet marañones, looking like bright bells, strikingly yellow or deeply red, each one with its delicious nut hanging below. The cashew nuts that my uncle made... Tardito and my younger Aunt Lolita loved to roast on a campfire by the river. Sweet and sour tamarindos, which we would soak in water to make a delicious drink. Fragrant guayabas, brilliantly green on, uh, brilliantly green outside and a sweet red inside. Gaimitos, round as a baseball with shining purple skin and delicate milky white flesh. And then there were dozens of coconut trees, whose fruit, the cocos, we treasured above all. They swayed with the wind, making the island always fresh and breezy. The water of the young coconuts is fresh and sweet. As the young coconut matures, the water inside slowly becomes more solid, smooth as a light gelatin. We loved to eat them as they became fleshier, but were still soft and sweet. 
When the coconut meat became hard and dry, it was used to make desserts. And finally, there was the most highly valued and hardest to find. If a large, healthy coconut was kept for several weeks, perhaps even several months, at the right temperature, in a moist and shadowy place, then perhaps it would sprout. And if it did, and someone knew how to open it at the right time, she would find that the thick, dry meat inside the coconut had pulled away from the husk and had gathered in the center of the coconut as a soft, porous ball, the manzana del coco, or apple of the coconut, exquisitely sweet. On one of the island's shores stood a bamboo grove where my grandmother would hang her hammock every afternoon to rest for a while between her two jobs as the principal of a school for children in the morning <clears throat> and a school for women at night. The rustle of the bamboos and the coconut palms provided an enchanting, soothing melody. Although we lived far inland, a couple of hours away from the ocean shore, the sea breezes seemed still to share rumors of distant lands and remote places. Though I grew up surrounded by loving people and fascinated by all the life around me, it was to the trees that I told my sorrows and my joys, and especially my dreams. It was the trees that, like a family, grew and branched out. Like all of life, they yielded in some ways to stories that came and went. Some, like the flame trees, were stolid and almost timeless. Others were abundant with fruit and offspring. I could not help but see how, in their own way, they described the life around me. Life that is reflected in these stories I will tell. The stories of my family all took place at various times. Some happened before I was born and were told to me as a child. The others all happened as I was growing up, until I was about ten years old. Most of them took place in the magnificent old house, the Quinta Simoni, where I lived until I was eight. In others, you will see more of the town itself, where we moved after that. But even in town, I was fortunately never too far from the generous trees majestically swaying in the tropical breezes, or, as with the flame trees, bursting with fiery red flowers, blossoming, blossoming, blossoming. As I share these stories with you, I can still see the tall and majestic royal palms, the coconut trees swaying easily in the warm tropical breezes, and the fiery flame trees bursting all over with their abundant red blossoms. And I hope that the inspiration... The inspiration that I continue to receive from these companions of my childhood will, in turn, help warm the hearts of others. The Teacher My mother's mother, my grandmother Dolores, was known as Lola. She filled my early years with outdoor adventures, fun, and fascinating stories. The deeds of the Greek gods and goddesses, the heroic feats of the Cuban patriots, were as immediate to me as her everyday life at the two schools where she was principal, an elementary public school during the day, and a school for working women in the evenings. It is not surprising that there are many stories in our family about this woman who is both an intellectual and a practical person, who cut her hair and shortened her skirts before any other woman in our town, who created a literary journal, founded schools, awakened a great passion in the poet who married her, and brought up five children as well as several nieces and nephews while directing her own schools and farms. One of my favorite stories about her was told to me at various times by my mother and by my aunts Maria and Virginia, since all three of them were present when the events took place. Unlike many other family stories, which are often changed or embellished depending on the teller, I have always heard the story told exactly the same way. Perhaps that is because the story itself is too powerful to be embellished, or because the the events impressed themselves so vividly upon the memories of those present. My grandmother Lola loved to teach outdoors. The slightest pretext would serve to take the whole class out under the trees to conduct her lessons there. This particular story took place during one of those outdoor lessons, at a time when she and her husband, my grandfather Medardo, were in a boarding school in the hacienda she had inherited from her father and where later I would be born. Surrounded by her pupils, including three of her own daughters, my grandmother was conducting a grammar lesson. Suddenly she interrupted herself. Why is it, she asked her students, that we don't often speak about the things that are truly important? about our responsibility as human beings for those around us. Do we really know their feelings, their needs? And yet we could all do so much for each other. The students were silent, spellbound. They knew their teacher sometimes strayed from the topic of the lesson in order to share with them her own reflections. And they also knew that those were some of her most important lessons. At times she could be funny and witty. Other times she would touch their hearts. And so they listened. Look, continued my grandmother, as she pointed to the road that bordered the farm. There the students saw a solitary man walking. Look at that old man. He is walking by us. In a few minutes he will be gone forever, and we will never have known who he is, where he is going, what may be important in his life. The students watched the man, who by then was quite close. He was very thin, and of course Guayabera hung loosely over his bent frame. His face, in the shade of a straw hat, was weathered and wrinkled. Well, said my grandmother, do we let him go away, forever unknown, or do you want to ask him if there is anything we can do for him? The students looked at one another. Finally, one girl said, shall I ask him? As my grandmother nodded, the girl got up and walked toward the road. A few of the other students followed her, my mother and my aunts among them. Upon seeing them approach, the man stopped. We would like to know who you are and where you are going, said the student. Is there anything we can do for you? added my Aunt Maria. The man was completely taken aback. But who are you? was all he could reply. The girls then explained how their questions had come about. The old man looked at them. He told them that he had no one to be with, that he had come a long distance hoping to find some distant relatives, but had been unable to locate them. I'm nothing but an old man, he, con he concluded, looking for a place to lie down and die. As a matter of fact, I was heading toward that large sieba, 